we're seeing a more balanced labor marketplace of pay me a fair salary. And, and so what I always tell my clients is, listen, pay a fair market wage because it then gives you the moral high ground to demand fair market performance. And if we have equilibrium of those two things, I'll win every time. Welcome to Mission to Grow, the small business guide to cash, compliance, and the war for talent. I'm your host, Mike Vinoy. Each week, we'll bring you experts in accounting, finance, human resources, benefits, employment law, and more. You'll learn ways to access capital through creative financing and tax strategies, tactical information you need to stay compliant with ever-changing employment laws, and people strategies you need to win the war for talent. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. Enjoy the show. I have a really, really cool guest today. He's a speaker. He's an entrepreneur. He's a financial expert. His firm has been named to the 5000 list. He's presented in over 15 countries. He's a frequent speaker to groups like EO, Scaling Up, Vistage, and HTEC. He's been a member of the Entrepreneurs Organization for almost nine years. He's the author of two books, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits, a great book, highly recommend. I'm not through number two yet. Simple Numbers 2.0, Rules for Smart Scaling. He's the partner at Car Riggs. Nettingham is a top 25 accounting and advisory firm. Welcome to the show, Greg Crabtree. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Mike. So, Greg, uh, man, uh, lots to talk about uh, yeah. for small business owners trying to grow their business. If you just had to give one single piece of advice to small business owners, what, what would that be to help them grow their business through a financial lens? Right now, what I would tell them is they, they have to assess a, a tectonic change in the marketplace as, as we were chatting, you know, kind of pre-show and that, um, you know, the last 20 years was what I call the participation trophy economy. Uh, it was growing. We patted ourselves on the back of how effective our marketing and sales technique, techniques were, and we were just being given gifts of the market. And we were getting our share of the market growth, but we weren't gaining market share. Population demographics is tilted. All of my peers, I'm the tail end of the baby boom generation. We sailed off in the sunset here the last couple of years, and there's not a workforce that's large enough to replace us. And Part of it too is you got to understand that the, the most uh, valuable years of your career, are the last 10 that you work. And so the last 10 years has been, you know, the swan song of the, of, of the baby boomers. Yeah. And so now they've taken that wealth, they've gone off market. Now they'll, there's still a residual consumption from that group, but they will start shrinking their consumption as they get older. And with a declining birth rate in the U S that's probably pushing a 1.5 when you need a 2.1 to be stable. The workforce isn't there. AI is going to help a little bit, but there, you know, AI, AI doesn't know how to dig a ditch. I mean, AI, you know, there's, there's, there's things they can't do. Um, and, and, and most of my experience so far, AI is not replacing jobs. It's just augmenting better capability of the jobs that already exist. And, yeah. and so, but th there'll be a few, that, 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 no doubt. But at the end of the day, what I say that we're into now is we have a flat economy in real terms. Now, it's really, really hard to measure. I'll give the government some slack of gross domestic product is a really hard thing to measure because that's an output measure. Well, how do you measure output in a labor-centric economy? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it, it, it's ours. No, it's not. I mean, I got news for you. I mean, one of the key premises of simple numbers in, in our philosophy is the isolation of labor. And our rule is never, ever, ever mix labor with something that's not labor. I must isolate labor because it is the main fulcrum that you use to create leverage in a business. And, it, it, what, you, and what, you, what do you mean by that, Greg, when you say you must isolate it? You're saying fr from an expense perspective. From an expense perspective and, and from an analysis perspective. I mean, if you go read a public company's financial statement, you will not see labor broken out in that financial statement for a reason. There's got that part of it. They want to hide it, but yeah. two, they, you know, they, they, they like to play games and, and, and move those things around. So in our, in our simple numbers presentation, we will isolate direct labor and management labor. We can do some sub analysis for bigger companies, but, but essentially. I don't, it, for our smaller businesses, the, the 10 million and under businesses, we really highlight the idea, Hey, I don't really care who's directing who's management. 90% of the businesses in the U S work off of one 
one economic standard to be profitable. I need $2 of gross margin for every dollar of labor I spend, and I don't care what they do. I don't care if it's the CEO or the floor sweeper. And in every, almost every core business works off of that number. And you'll see businesses, you can survive at a 1.8. You can, you're running hot at a 2.1. But we, uh, one of the things in our practice that's unique is, uh, I mean, we, we have clients all over the U.S., Canada, Australia. Our U.S. clients, we take 100 of those clients and we use them as an economic model. We call it our simple numbers 100 model. It's about a billion of revenue. So the average company is a little over 10 million a year in revenue, some bigger, some smaller, but the average is 10. And, and we use that as our economic picture of what the marketplace is actually doing because the government doesn't have that data. Right. I mean, over, you know, the best estimate that I've seen and, and uh, is over 60% of the U S GDP are by privately held businesses that do not publish their financial data. Right. So how is it that the government comes up with economic statistics? Well, it's a wild ass gas. I mean, it's just. Greg, you can, can you unpack this ratio a little bit for, uh, yeah, for us? Absolutely. Yeah. Is it, so yeah. How, how yeah. do you get there? Yeah. So how you get there is you start with revenue, which is one of the weakest numbers known to mankind. On the, it, it's just a starting point for math, but do not fall in love with revenue. The next number is cost of goods sold. Yeah. What are my materials or subcontractors? direct travel, those kind of things. I'm going to take those things that are paid to somebody outside the business that's in, that's part of what I'm billing my customer for, take that out. And that gets me to gross margin. Gross margin is before any labor costs have been deducted. Gross margin, I contend, is the true economic top line of every business. And so you will notice if you turn to page 22 of this Simple Number Straight Talk Big Profits book, my first book, you'll see it was kind of this first aha moment if I took a $20 million construction company and compared it to a $3.7 million services business. And once I subtract con uh, uh, cost of goods sold and get to gross margin, they're both a $2,850,000 gross margin business. Yeah. Once 20 million in revenue. And it's like, well, big whoop de doo You're, you're a, you're a construction contractor with a pickup truck. I mean, you know, come on. You know, yep. But if you filter everybody down to gross margin and then run your ratios from there as if that's the top line, I can compare. We, we put everybody on a level playing field when we do that. Now, and then, as I said, the number one profitability metric is how much gross margin I get for every dollar of labor. Now, in, in, in the world of labor, there's different plays you can run just like in football. Am I a running team? Am I a passing team? Am I a balanced team? We labor strategy is the same thing. And so therefore the reason why I start with that total LER metric is LER stands for labor efficiency ratio. Um, it, we're looking at a dollar of labor as an input. What is the margin output? Whereas for, for centuries, accountants have flipped that formula and looked at labor as a percentage of something, typically right. revenue, which right. is a grossly flawed calculation. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, you know, I want to go deep on on on, yeah. the, on the labor efficiency. Sure. Uh, where do you see firms making mistake on even how to get to gross margin? Because what you just described is purely outside expense. I know there's a lot of small businesses. Mm -hmm. I've made this. I've done it. With maybe you're going to yeah. teach me how much the mistake I've made yeah. is. You know, uh, okay. The, the, the labor associated with the directly serving that customer or delivering on that goods or services. I've prob I've, I've thrown a lot into cogs. Yeah. Where, where do you see people making mistakes? Well, the, the mistake is you're mixing labor with something that's not labor. So, so in there's a, there's three data points in what we call the business engine. So I start revenue minus cost of goods. That's not labor. So that gets me to gross margin. Gross margin minus direct labor is a term, what we call contribution margin. It's essentially gross profit. What, mo you know, if you, if you do your books in QuickBooks, QuickBooks will force that label of gross profit. Gross profit's a sloppy term. So we, we, that, that we, we stick to any subcomponent of your economic model. We like a, the term margin. So, yeah, you know, is it channel margin? Is it gross margin? Is it contribution yeah. margin? You know, those type of things. But when we get down to that number, 
you know, that's telling me what's the true output of the, the business engine. And that's the piece that is going to scale. Once you're a viable business, more than, more than likely that part of your business is going to stay at those same rates unless you start to perform badly. And I, I refer to this as the law of the big. I mean, as you get bigger, you actually get worse in your metrics. You don't get better. Yeah, and you have to fight like the Dickens to hold on to your margin, hold on to your labor efficiency ratio, because as you get bigger, you hire more people. And I mean, you know, you have an HR background and you understand this completely. When I go from 50 employees to a hundred, I got a lot more people that are sitting around, you know, figuring out what to do. And they're not as productive individually as they were when we were 10 people and we were focused on production. And there's and a they, lot of so, our so, world. It's even harder yet because there are literally more laws you must comply with. It's not just revenue going up into the right. It's number of laws I must yeah. comply with number of tax jurisdictions and the, the, the level of complexity goes up. So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's an easy trap to fall in to just, just simply throw yeah. more labor at solving those problems. And, and granted, there's a, there's a handful, I mean, a really, really small group of outliers on the upside, a, a, hand, a handful of business models. On the downside of that two gross mar two dollars of gross margin to every dollar of labor model, typically the the companies that are going to be below the two that can survive, those are what we call staffing companies. So essentially, you you don't you're hiring a person who for, who goes and works for somebody else that I don't manage. I don't have management costs for that. So that's how you you kind of somewhat get away with it. But a staffing leverage model is pretty dreadful for the most part. Right. Uh, you know, so, uh, so, so really at the end of the day, once you know that, that target, that $2 to, to $1 of all labor is that's an immediate health diagnostic. You know, if you're a, a consistent business without seasonality, I can take the last three months of your data and do an immediate health diagnostic of your business and say, well, here's your problem. And, and so. And, and so HR, I live in a world of like, we, we think a lot about like FTE versus, right. versus yeah. part-timers because there's different legal requirements and, and, and say so you count, you count bodies and you're counting pieces sure. of body. And that, that is the flaw. Yeah. It, and, in and, and that we, not my firm, we, I'll say the, mm -hmm. the HR laws, the IRS, it simply yeah. requires you. There are formulas you must follow mm -hmm. by law to calculate FTE to calculate part-time because it affects, you know, whether yeah. you have to provide benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So and see, those are, those are compliance issues. Those are not productivity issues. Yes. So, yes. They, yes, they're important. They're important for compliance management, but at the end of the day, a dollar is no respecter of persons. It's a, for every dollar of labor input, what is the lever of margin output that I get? Now, sometimes if you're in a professional services world, so I can actually get to labor efficiency by person of my direct bill people, because the way our timekeeping system works and allocation of write-offs and those things, I know a reasonable approximation of revenue by person. And we don't have a COGS for what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but if we did, you know, we could calculate that. Now, the thing is, I got people that don't produce, they support the people that produce. So if I'm going to get a two total LER of gross margin to all labor, I got to have my direct people getting more than a two lever right. to get there to cover the cost of the people who don't produce. They support the people that produce, you know, in that process. And now other businesses that are team oriented, you know, sometimes, so, um, that the first client, uh, we, we refer to him as client zero, the first client that we started doing a lot of this labor efficiency analysis on was a landscaping company out in Omaha, Nebraska. And. And so, so we were looking at the total number, but then we started breaking it down by types of work that they did. So they did landscaping, they did irrigation work, they did snow removal, and they did, uh, lawn mowing. Well, snow removal is kind of an off season thing. So we take, you know, and, and it did have a labor efficiency ratio, but take that one out of the equation because it's not a 12 month a year thing, but all the other things they did roughly 12 months out of the year, a little bit less mowing in the winter, obviously, but still some. And, and so. We looked at it and we looked at, we could measure gross margin by those three types of services and we can measure labor by those three types of services. Well, they, they had got a four to one ratio of direct labor you know, to gross margin in landscaping and irrigation. 
when they got $2.50 leverage on mowing. And so we were sharing the data with the team members at the company and the $10 an hour mowing guy, this was back in 2009. So that's when you could pay somebody $10 an hour and mow grass. The $10 an hour mowing guy uttered this, these words of wisdom. Looks like to me, we shouldn't be in the mowing business. I, and, I, and it's like, that is the perfect example of simple numbers. Now, if I share this and I'm going to crack on my accounting brethren, if I share this with a group of accountants or financial hooty toady types, they're just going to go all into a tiz and start arguing. And it's like, no, you, you don't understand the simplicity of this. The, the guy's right. And that company today does not do mowing. They subcontract it out. They get a cut as a marketing fee for having sold it. Yeah. They don't have to do it. Yeah. And it, and it's that simplistic understanding of what are the DNA building blocks of labor leverage that there is not a business that exists in the world that does not leverage labor to create profit. Greg, I'm assuming you have business owners all the time say, oh, but you don't understand my industry. Yeah? I run a hair salon, yeah. we're 100% commission, or we're a hair salon and I pay salary, or we're a hair salon mm. and I pay uh, an hourly plus bonus. Pay. I mean, mm. everybody's got their their models. That's right. They how, do. How do, how, do you, how do you help business owners compare, contrast different ways to approach the problem? Well, I mean, it's the simple number structure is what, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I kind of fell into it, but I mean, it's magical, you know, from that standpoint, because let, let's take the hair salon as a great example. I, I have, uh, I have two different ways to run a hair salon. I can hire employees that do styling. And so therefore there's a revenue number that goes, that I charge the customer for. There's a cost of goods for supplies and, and chemicals and, and those things, you know, in the hair styling process. That gets me to gross margin. And then, and I, and I guarantee you, you guys, a, a, hair, a hair salon works off of the two to one standard. I got, I can spend $1 of labor for every $2 of gross margin that I generate. Some of that goes to the stylist. Some of it goes to the front desk staff that's checking people out, scheduling, uh, book, uh, doing bookkeeping yeah. and the overall general manager of the business. So yeah. I'm uh, that, that business model of the hair salon is just like an NFL franchise. There's a salary cap and guess what? Your salary cap is gross margin. And I get to take 50% of that gross margin and use it for labor. And I can then decide, do I want a steady run of low paid stylists that will turn over and go leave and go someplace else for more pay? Or do I pay them a little bit more to keep them stable? Yeah, But if, if I pay them more, I have to be more efficient with my management labor. I can go heavy, direct, yeah. skinny management. I can go skinny, direct. I can go heavy management. But take your pick. I can, I can win both ways, but each comes with their, the, the counterbalancing effect that, that I have to balance for. I can't go heavy, heavy. Otherwise, I have a job with all the headaches of ownership and I make and no so, money. And so the magic, it, it, it's just, it's a... Uh... It, 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 as long as you're living within your two to one ratio, those are the decisions you make, right? right. Oh, I'm going right. to provide, I'm going to provide benefits and I'm going to have mm -hmm. all this, uh, Cadillac yeah. services for my stylists. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe that helps you to recruit the most talented people and retain them. That means you're going to have to have an operating strategy that is really, really lean. That's right. Or I'm only going to hire fresh graduates from cosmetology school I'm going to have to, uh, and it's not going to cost me as much money, but I'm going to have to spend a ton in training yeah. in development and recruiting. Yeah. Now, so let, let's go to the other model. So the other model is the booth rental model. Yeah. So I have revenue. I charge the customer. My cost of goods sold is now the cut that I give the stylist because I don't get that. That goes to them. And that's now my, gro I got a much lower gross margin. I, I probably... I, you know, I may allocate some of my labor to direct or not, but it's still a two to one ratio. And so if I'm doing booth rental, I mm -hmm. gotta have, I, I can only spend $1 of labor for every dollar of gross margin that my stylist after their, uh, their booth rental, you know, it allows me to do. And it, it, and it, this is just a universal concept with very few outliers, but, yeah. but once again, every business has its perfect signature. 
and you will live to that signature unless you dramatically change your business model. But, but for example, our hundred company model of that billion of revenue, we mm -hmm. now have it the most recent split. We split it between the companies that are up year over year versus down year over year. So just to give you a clue of the current economy, 70% of that billion is up year over year in revenue and they're up about 10% year over year. I, I can't tell you exactly, but my sense is about 8% of that 10 are price increases, not productivity increases or right. not, and not output increases. Right. The 30% that's down, they're down 17%. Mm. Now, if I take the group that's up, uh, the, 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 that's up, uh, year over year, their total labor efficiency ratio to the group that's down 1.69. Cause they're, wow. they're sucking on profitability and the one reason why they suck on profitability, they have adjusted their direct labor as they have fallen 17% in volume. Okay. They didn't adjust their management labor. Right. They've held on to management labor saying, oh, this is temporary. Oh, that we're going to go back up. Right. I got news for you. No, you're not going to go back up because those, that 30% that's down, those are the discretionary businesses that. They got to fight for their place in the, in the, in the customer's wallet. And that, and there's a lot of competition for customer. Yeah, that, wallet right that's now. like the perfect segue to come back to the top where, yeah. where you're talking about, uh, you know, the, we are not living in the same world. We were five years yeah. ago. I, I, I talk about this all the time yeah. that, you know, uh, I think, I think people falsely blame, uh, a pandemic. Obviously mm -hmm. that was a huge yeah. thing that impacted all of us, but a pandemic, presidential politics, a war in Ukraine, Ukraine, inflation. We blame all these things, but the biggest driver for us is demographics and birth rates of it's birth rate. You know, it's absolutely years ago, yeah. and the supply of labor, and the amount that people consume at certain ages. Right, so young people, you know, they're reliant on their on on, on their mm -hmm. parents. They, they don't they don't they might spend a lot, but it's not their money, right? You yep. start getting out of, out of school, you start to have a family, your cars more expensive, your homes are more expensive. You start having babies, they get real darn expensive. Yep. Um, you, you, you become an empty nester, you know, you probably, you maybe still paid a mortgage, but it's based on 10, 15, 20 year ago prices yep. and your car may be paid for. You don't have as many crumb crushers that you're feeding. So yep. the consumption goes down. It's like, it's both supply and labor and consumption that this the I'm I'm an old Xer. You're a, you're a young boomer. It's like th this. What's this era kind of comes through? We yeah. are truly in a new world, and it has nothing to do with pandemic politics. Yeah. Well, now we'll the pa pandemic was just a, a distraction. Uh, we actually so we were tracking this data before the pandemic, and so our hunter company model showed us. Uh, I started in my base year was 2013, and so this is this is my growth. Because we really didn't have much in the way of inflation throughout the late teens. I mean, it was, you know, two, three percent a year. But I mean, we, you know, we we couldn't get pro clients to raise prices because they were profitable and they were doing good. And, yeah. you know, they were competitive and they, they were happy. And and so um, in 2014, our model had 14 uh, percent year over year growth. Um, I'm sorry, uh, 14, it was 20 percent year over year growth. 15 was 14 percent year over year growth. 16 was, uh, 15% year over year growth, 17 and 18 were 22% year over year growth, but 19 was eight. And if you go back and this is where people, people lose context of history yeah. and move, movement of data. Yeah. We ran out of labor in the middle of 2019. Yeah. And that's when you started to see, uh, key, uh, ex key, uh, team members being poached for higher pay. You couldn't, you you know, we were, all, we'd already dropped below. We were about 4% unemployment at that point. And the rule of thumb has always kind of been, if you drop below 5% unemployment, you're down to the unemployable anyway. So, you know, but, but now, I mean, we're down in the, the I mean, functionally in a lot of the markets, it's one or 2% unemployment. For me, people and, don't know when you think what's the biggest thing that happened in 2020, obviously pandemic comes to mind. Presidential politics was a bit of a hot mess. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think over the long span, 2020 was the tipping point where there were more people over working age 65 than there were yeah. under working age of 21. It's, it's the first time in our 
entire country's history. Yeah. And it got missed because of all the other big stuff that was happening. And, and you did. The one thing I will say, you know, the pandemic accelerated the people on the edge of retirement to just go ahead and retire. Now, a couple of those, some of those have come back and, and started to work a little bit, but it's still just not enough to matter. But it, even in my own case, I mean, I, I did my part. I got four kids, uh, but I've only got five grandkids and, and I got five granddaughters and I, I keep saying, Hey, you know, I, I said, listen, guys, until you get to, to nine, I, you know, we're, I, I need nine grandkids to maintain 2.1, you know, replacement birth rate, but yeah, I, I don't right. think th they're not going to listen to me. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. And I mean, you know, the demographics is, is kind of like, uh, icebergs in the ocean. I mean, you, you kind of see the top of it and you see it. But you don't really recognize the impact of it because the mass of it is below the surface and out of sight. Yeah. And, and it's so connected to so many moving things. But here's the thing. Is that so bad? So let me throw this out. Yeah. Let's, so, so let's tr t tie this back to, so you, you and I geeked out on, you know, demographics or destiny and all this kind of yeah. stuff. Why does it matter to the small business owner? What, what is this, what does this new economy look like? Right. So the thing is, you know, everybody's employed. I mean, I would challenge most people to say, do you actually know somebody who literally cannot find a job to feed their family? Now they may be unemployed waiting for the right job. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, can you go get, make some money to put food on the table? And in almost every market all across the U S unless you have some lack of capability, yeah, everybody's, everybody's employed. Now, when the marketplace is employed, that's a good thing because we have a stable consumer base. The bad thing is, is it continues to be, I, I think the Fed has undersold the idea of it, you know, labor inflation is still the, the main cause and it, and, and we see this and I, I'll give you a great example. We have a, a HVAC group that we track. That's a hundred million of revenue of about 12 companies and their revenues are up 45% cumulative over the last three years. Wow. Their labor is up 45% over the last three years. Their operating costs are up 45% over the last three years. I mean, this is a, a classic business that because they're a necessary, they're able to pass through the price increases that they get from everything in their value chain, you know, of that, but the main driver being labor, because there's not an ex excess availability of HVAC qualified technicians and not going to be, right. uh, you know, and, and so they're able to price that in, but this is where the upstairs downstairs economy comes in and your listeners have to decide, are you a necessary where you can adjust your prices to your cost? Are you a discretionary where you got to climb, you got to get to the upper end of the discretionary food chain of where you're a highly desired discretionary, not a, I can live without discretionary. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Love and that. that's, and, and that's where, like I said, we're an upstairs, downstairs, 70% of the market are primarily necessary. 30% of the market is the discretionary. And you could even argue some of that 70% is really di discretionary if you really got hard with it, but, but everybody's employed. You don't have to get hard with it when everybody's employed. I mean, every recession that I've lived through in my lifetime came with a minimum of 7% unemployment to as much as 11 to 12% unemployment and as much as yeah. 15 to 20% unemployment in certain key areas of either demographics or, uh, or, or, you know, hyper-focused location, you know, in certain like, you know, uh, blighted areas. I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't find it anywhere in the U S right now. I, I've been writing articles on this for maybe a year, year and a half now, uh, that, and, and I'm not an economist, mm -hmm. but, but I'm a chicken farmer by trade. So I mean, what I, do I know? So. I'm a, I, I grew, I'm a farmer. My wife's a rancher and, uh, and, and find ourselves in corporate America. Every recession is always tied to, uh, uh unemployment. Well, yeah. unemployment is at what? 3.7%. It's the first time since the Nixon administration, we've gone two years under 4%. Yeah. Uh, and when you, when you see the demographic change, when you realize it's because of the demographic change, not because of other economic uh, drivers, yeah. there's not going to be an accompanying high yeah. unemployment rate. Therefore, is there going to be a recession? I, I think, it, I think what we're in is this massive, painful reset of expenses yeah. of labor versus goods. Well, and, 
and the way I've kind of described this is, listen, we got to forget about painting the economy with one broad stroke. It, it, you know, there are some people that are living a recession. There are some people that are living a, an adaptive you know, growth of the market. I will tell you, I don't have any clients that are massively growing in real output. I just have clients that are able to pass through their price increases. That's really and, well said. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. That's interesting. And, and, but it, and I get it. I, you know, I, I'll give them some slack that it's a hard number to measure. When we were a, an economy of things back in the 60s, you can measure industrial output by crates of shipment and those things. Yeah. I, I got maybe 20% of my clients who can measure actual output, but the, the rest of it, it's a fuzzy number. Greg, you said something, <laughs> maybe you laugh in the, when we were talking before the show. That uh, we, we were, we went from an economy where all ships rise with the, with the tide of demographics to now it's the street fighter, the knife fight economy. It, it's, street, it's a street fight economy. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so, like I said, you, you've got to be prepared, you know, like, I mean, the, the last 20 years was the participation trophy economy and we, we, we all patted ourselves on the back and thought, you know, we made this happen and no, you didn't. I mean, our, our clients are going through their marketing spin with a fine tooth comb right now, realizing that what they thought marketing did and helped them with, it didn't, it, it, it was work that was going to show up anyway. Now, it, and, and I'm a big fan of, I'm not cracking on marketing because I am a big fan of effective marketing spin. It's just difficult to find what is effective. And we, we're constantly scanning the, the landscape of our clients who are truly successful in that vein, you know, of, of doing it. Um, you know, but, but those are things that people are having to readjust to, but now it is a question of fighting for your share of the market. And one of the, uh, one of the things I get to do in my entrepreneur organization experience, I, I get to chair executive ed program at Horton business school. And I, and I get to present one of the days of content with the other legitimate professors and here they let this chicken farmer show up and say a few things, you know, but. But the lead professor, David Wessels, I mean, I, I, I just, I mean, he is, he's one sharp dude. And, and I, the first year that I sat through that class, he made a statement that just always stuck with me. Sometimes you have to change your where, not your share. And I think if you want, let's get back to kind of the first question of how do you grow? You may have to grow by changing your where you're a fixed geographic location that's pulling your customers from yes. one area. But, you know, to fight for market share growth, just think of Coke and Pepsi. I mean, they, they, the billions of dollars that they spend fighting each other for that 1% movement of share of the, of the, the market. I mean, it's brutal. Yeah. And so, okay, well, let's, let's maybe think about, you know, and, and what they both done is gone global and, and gone into markets where. You know, it, it was, they would be, you know, 80% of the market, you know, of, of something where they didn't have to fight until the other one came in and, you know, and started to beating them back, you know, but, but I think a lot of the smaller businesses have to start looking at that is my share growth strategy is totally different than getting my share of growth strategy. And that, that's a, that's a change in mindset. I've, I, I've given counsel to, to businesses that, uh, you got to get away from geography based value props and more mm -hmm. into, uh, it could be the, your, uh, you got a supply chain uniqueness. You could be a vertical based uniqueness. Um, how do you, how do you help a small business owner get there when they <laughs> see themselves? We're the best XYZ provider in, mm -hmm. in this county or this tri-state area or this state. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you get to that next level? Well, I mean, cause kind of in our simple numbers process, you know, we, we say, listen, I need to tell you where you've been. I need to tell you where you're at and I need to then help you look and project where you're going. And part of that is you're going to take a first cut at the business of looking at it. So think of it as splitting it into two pieces. What is your engine performance and what is your chassis? that, that you're using to support that engine. And most of the times the companies that need to be fixed and our, our philosophy is, is really simple. Get profitable with what you got before you think about growing. So if you are not presently hitting your minimum profitability standards, why do you think growing is going to make it better? No, it's only going to get worse. 
So you must, if you're, if you're past startup stage, you got to get profitable what you got so that then you've got the pattern to scale. And then once you get that pattern of what works, you're going to look at the engine, the three numbers of revenue, cogs, direct labor, get to what is my contribution margin for the engine. Now, once you start to become a bigger business, guess what? Your engine has really multiple engines. I have, I do four things. Like, you know, my business is we, we do three things. We do consulting, we do tax returns and uh, tax uh, advisory, and we do outsourced bookkeeping. And so I have an economic model for all three. And, you know, and each of them has a different profitability lever ratio between the revenue that it generates and the cost of the labor that it takes to produce it. Bookkeeping is arguably more of a commodity type service. And so what we want to do is rise to the non-commodity sector of the bookkeeping services and not try to be the answer to the masses. We want to be the answer to the, the specific higher margin areas. Yep. Uh, tax is its own unique beast with the challenges of dealing with a totally dysfunctional IRS yeah, for the most part. Um, and, and it's got its own labor challenge because the, the kids coming out of college today look at doing tax returns like it's working in the New York City sewers. Uh, so that has its, has its attraction challenges. But I think part of the labor market is coming back to it and realizing, you know, it is pretty steady work. So, you know, and, and, and I think we have a unique approach to it that if, if we can work it the right way, we can take the season this is kind of my innovation is I want to take the season out of that work so that it is a pretty steady workload. And there's a way to do it to where, even though you have some collision around deadlines, you know, you can work it. So those are strategies, but you got to understand the profitability model. And then our unique offering is our simple number consulting, because it's, it is our own take that's based on what's in the content in both books, but we see business through a singular lens. That has proven pretty powerful. I mean, to be quite honest, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things that I think these learnings have been hiding in plain sight, you know, for, for a long time. And the things that I glean, I didn't learn it in school. I learned it from my successful clients and I learned it from my unsuccessful clients. Cause I always like to say, you know, when all else fails, you can always serve as the bad example. Yeah. And, you know, so we, we learned from a few of the bad examples too. And. But it's like this labor efficiency thing has just been sitting there. And here, I, I was talking to one of my partners this morning, and I, I need to do this. Uh, and we have a few clients that we can go, go do this as a, as a study. Here's my contention. So I've just told you the magic numbers, too. So if, if anybody leaves this podcast, just remember the number two. I need $2 of gross margin for every dollar of labor. I don't care what that labor does. That, that's, that's kind of the standard we want you to go look at. And everybody can do that calculation or should be able to do it. 20 years ago, if we look at businesses, what, what do you think the total labor efficiency ratio was 20 years ago? Probably two. changed, right? No, it's two. Yeah. What was it 40 years ago? I'm, two. Yeah. Because here's the thing. You may get a moment of up to 2.1, maybe even to 2.2. And then as competitors, you can't hide forever. As competitors figure out what you're doing and they compete with you, guess what, what do competitors do when they try to compete with you? Well, they offer a lower price for the same thing and it competes the, the ratio standard back to the mean, right? Because the two is the standard of what it takes to be minimally, to, to meet your, the, the, the median profit standard, not the minimum profit, the median profit standard. And, and so there'll always be some below and some above, but, but the average is going to be two. And, and so the market always gives away its gains. And so this is my argument to the AI dreamers of the world. Yes, AI is going to help increase some productivity in certain areas eventually, but people will give away that benefit eventually as they compete against each other and compete you back to, I need $2 of gross margin for every dollar of direct labor. Right, right. Just the way it is. Yeah, I'm a huge believer in the promise. I think you, the timeline is probably in question, but I'm mm. the, the promise of, of AI. But you're exactly right. Oh, yeah. The the productivity of my own team, we've been early adopters uh, on, on AI, and our productivity is just, it, it, it's crazy yeah. as, as we use it. 
but yeah. it's just a matter of time before everybody else is using it. And then all yeah. of a sudden you're back to being equal. That's right. That's right. It, 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 and it allows us to do more, which is great. I mean, we need to be able to do more with this, with less labor, but here's the other competing force. Everybody would agree with this. I, I, I very few, I think would disagree with this statement. We are consistently paying more and more for our labor every day and getting less and less for it. Now that, that is what the pandemic accelerated. Now that, is, that trend was already happening a little bit before the pandemic, but the pandemic accelerated. Say what you a, mean by that. Cause I would have thought maybe the opposite labor becomes more productive through advanced tools. No, uh, it, I mean, it, it might a little bit, but, but really at the end of the day, I mean, people are working, they want to work, they want to make more money because the marketplace is competing for that labor. You know, just, just like look, look at NFL salaries. I mean, what were NFL salary, NFL salaries 20 years ago, and then what are they today? I mean, you know, it, it it's massive. Well, you know, the so average I'm, skill, I'm st is still stuck in my FTE mindset, right? Cause I'm thinking how productive is this FTE versus how productive is the dollar spent? Right. You know, I used to pay $40,000 for an entry level bookkeeper and now it's 60, you know? And, and so, I mean, and that person is producing less, is less prepared, is working less hours for that same dollar amount of pay yeah. is what they, they were. Now, part of this is, and I do agree, companies that paid people salaries and work people overtime, they cheated the market. I mean, that, that, that's really a labor productivity cheat. And my profession is king of the cheats, you know, in, in that process. And I, yeah. I just, I, I wholeheartedly disagree with that idea. And I think you've got to be fair with labor practices. And now labor has a way to effectively negotiate because it's scarce. That's exactly and, right. That's yeah. And, and so therefore we're seeing a more balanced labor marketplace of pay me a fair salary. And, and so what I always tell my clients is that, listen, pay a fair market wage because it then gives you the moral high ground to demand fair market performance. And if we have equilibrium of those two things, I'll win every time. Greg, one of the things you talk about in your book is, um, the challenge employers sometimes have they'll okay, maybe my strategy, and I'm, I'm going back to like that hair salon example, mm -hmm. you know, I might have a high expense, uh, strategy cause I want to recruit the best. I want the most talented people. They're going to impress the clients the most, but therefore I got to have a really thin, thin management st structure. Yep. <laughs> What's the trap about simply paying more to simply, so paying top of market. And what does that really get you? I think you talked about your experience. That doesn't as, as long well as as long as I get top of market margin out of it, or in, and if it's a pure service, top margin of revenue, you know. But there again, there's a there's a graph that I put in the second book in the LER chapter, and it it's it's one of my probably most requested uh, graphs. It's called the career labor efficiency curve, and so think of it like this: and and of a producer. And, and that's, that's an employee. Yeah. There's three phases. There's the training zone, the chasing zone and the replacement zone. And so the training zone is I'm paying a person more in compensation than what they're producing because they're training. And the goal there is I'm trying to compress that time frame to as short a period as possible to at least break even, and then have that person enter the second phase, which I call the chasing zone for a reason. And the reason why I call it the chasing zone is if a business is to be successful, your pay must chase performance, not performance chase pay. And companies that fail in their labor strategy, they overpay and that person, they're constantly having that expensive person chase a performance metric and and every time they get close to it, the person, oh, what I need a more, you know, I, if I don't get a raise, I'm going to go someplace else. And we see this in all of the professions, industries. And yes, the person is producing something, but when you quantify it, I mean, I can stack rank every person in my office of here's your revenue you produced. Here's what I paid you. Here's your individual labor efficiency ratio. And I can stack them from the best to worst in labor efficiency ratios. And when you start to get a person that's below a two, 
individual labor efficiency ratio, they are sucking that. If I need a two overall, but I got a direct person that's below a two, they're, they're detracting from the system. And, and we see this in, in practices of all types all over the place. And, and we go, why, why are you, why are you doing that? That, that person either needs to produce more or you need to bill more for when they do produce, pick one of the two, but the current economic relationship of revenue to what you're paying them is, isn't working. Greg, some, some jobs are easy to quantify a sales job. Uh, uh, maybe if you're, you're a direct billable type, yeah, type direct job. billable is, yeah. but lots of jobs are going to be hard. They're somewhere That's in right. the value supply chain. That's right. Yeah. Hard, hard to quantify. How, how do you help firms? How do you help small well, businesses? Well, you look at those as teams. And so like my manufacturing clients, I mean, I look at gross margin, you know, to the, the direct labor of, of the team on the floor that's producing stuff. And we're monitoring that number. And the, and the thing is, is we monitor our primary labor efficiency metric, you know, would be looking at it on a rolling 12 basis. Secondary would be rolling three. So I'm looking at, you know, rolling 12, I believe the most, cause that's all 12 months, all four seasons, every dog ate my homework excuse. Rolling threes, I have to be mindful if they're a seasonal business. But if they're not seasonal, so like a good example, we do a lot of work in the IT MSP space. And so our IT companies that do managed services, they're, they're consistent 12 months out of the year. And so when we see one that's failing in performance and we get them to fix things, we can see that immediate performance. And I'll give you a great example is let, let's use a marketing firm. So I use this a lot of times when I do a talk, um, I'll be talking to a group of marketing companies and they're, they're not profitable. I says, okay, here's the deal. So we're, we're in the middle of February. I want you to look at March. How much are you going to pay in labor for the month of March? You, you, you know, that today you can get within a, a rounding error of how much you're going to pay in labor in March. Yep. Guess what? Your gross margin target for the month of March is two times labor. I, I guarantee you the rest of the stuff will work. You, you're, you're, you're majoring on the minor when you're chasing all these other operating expenses. You, you can't cut kitchen supplies enough to get profitable. Right. It, it is the, when you get the labor leverage, right. I rarely have to chase down any other operating expense. Um, occasionally somebody might be overspending on marketing. Um, you know, but, uh, I, I would say. I, I probably have more times I'm getting a client that's underspending on marketing more so than overspend. So I, I would say it, it goes both ways. Um, you know, and the, you, you mentioned this earlier and I'll tell you kind of an interesting trend that I see. You mentioned about benefits, you know, we just don't have a lot of discussion with our clients about benefits anymore. Um, you know, I mean, everybody likes them, but you know, the most employees are really pushing for, Hey, I need more spendable dollars in my pocket to deal with the current mm -hmm. economy. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, and yeah, you know, I mean, part of it is, is kind of the, you know, the, the healthcare issue, uh, rightly or wrongly kind of push that more common in the market that most businesses have an insurance strategy of, of how they deal with it. Payroll taxes are payroll taxes. I mean, you can't do anything about that. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, work with comp is work with comp, you know, but, but, but at the end of the day, I mean, people aren't pushing for 401ks and, and those things as much as when you give them, when you give the vast majority of an option of, you want me to contribute to a 401k or you want me to give, pay you more money, they take more money and that, they want the now. And, you know, and that, that seems to now in, in some of the professional industries, I mean, yeah, it, you got to look at your industry and say, what are the competitive benefits? But there again, if you're competitive in your benefits, you're still back to that two to one gross margin to all labor ratio is that that's the piece that makes everything else work. I wish it was more complex. I could charge more for it, but it's not, you know, so. Rick, do you see, I think I know the answer, but I think I would have been predicted wrong. Um, so in, Businesses, small businesses try, under 10 million, they're trying to grow. You're trying to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. Where, where is their model broken most frequently? They got too much fixed costs. They got, they signed up for a big expensive lease in a beautiful place or 
They got some machinery that is just, you know, that they thought they're going to use. Maybe it's not as productive as they thought. Or is it, you, those things are harder to fix, right? Because you got right. long-term cost structures. Yeah. But is it, is it, are they typically broken in the fixed cost areas? Or yeah. is it really as simple as labor efficiency? Rare, rarely do I see a facilities issue. I mean, rarely, almost never. It is a, it is a labor productivity issue first of you used to be profitable and you've now descended into, I've paid people more and more money and I'm not charging any, I can't get any more for it. And, and so like you look at the, the medical industry that takes insurance, I mean, brutal because they can't change their price. They, they're, they're cap and. But their costs have absolutely increased and you're seeing them turn out expensive people that they would love to have kept. They just can't afford them. And they, and, and so they, they kind of change over, uh, others that, you know, I mean, our, our IT industry, a, a good example, they've let a lot of the senior IT people go that got up into the 150, $200,000 super senior technician range yeah. going, it's great to have you, but I can't make any money on you. Yeah. And so you have to let them go to a bigger company and be an in-house IT person or something like that. But I can't bill you for services when you get too expensive. And that goes into that, that third phase that I talked about the replacement zone. So when you get to the third phase of your career, your salary keeps going up and up, but you kind of run out of juice at some point, either, or the market just won't pay any more for your skill set. And when you see that compression of what your revenue is to your cost and it flips, you, you got to say, great knowing you, I need you to go find another job because I can't make money off of you. Greg, safe to say that a lot of growth minded entrepreneurs think, okay, they think top line, top line, top line. Yeah. I'm going to grow, 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 grow. Yeah. And every dollar goes back on the business. I don't care about profit and I'll, I'll worry about making profit later right now it's all about quote unquote scale they think it's a scale game what, what's your what do you say to those folks you know the, the well and see the scale game is different because the the other if i can get them fixed in their profit model then their second problem is how do i grow because we've lost the art of active selling we, we we've kind of gotten lured into the last 20 years of being passive marketers and and i get it i mean passive marketing is is a valid component but we have, because the marketplace was so strong in the last 10 years, even the last 10 to 15, you know, since 08, the 08 recession, that was, if you go 09 to, to 2019, that 10, 10, 11 year period was the fastest, greatest economic growth in us history, in my opinion. Yeah. And I mean, it was real growth, but we lost the the professional sales cap skill set in the industry that's required when you get into a street fight economy where I got to go punch my competitor in the mouth and take their customer away from them. Yeah. And we haven't, we haven't been in that mode. Yeah. We, you win customers from a competitor, but you didn't go take them away. You, you just answered the door because they failed at serving them. That's not taking a customer away. Right. That, that's just, that's getting a gift to the market. Um, because the market has put pressure on people to continue to deliver quality service with, with restricted labor. Yeah. And, and so you're going to see more service failures that will cause people to shift their, their allegiance, you know, in, in that market. But especially you see this in B2B businesses, that those are hard sales businesses and the sales talent is at its all time low. I think, you know, and our clients that need professional sales talent are really struggling to get that skill set. But they still have to get profitable what you got to run a stable business. Now, and it's, I'll say it's yeah. compounded by the fact that the solutions are way more complex than they used to be, too. And that's right. Now, you said something else about the, the putting all my money back into the business. You know, if you hit your profit target, there's plenty, you know, uh, uh, we, we call it, you know, kind of the distribution model that once I get you fully capitalized, so. I got to get you to get you, get to your tip, your correct profit target. And I get you to have two months of cash that covers your operating expenses for two months, everything other that you don't get terms on. That's your target amount of cash in the business. Have zero drawn on a line of credit. That is our definition of a fully capitalized business. So it's, it's unique to every business, but that, that is, it's probably one of the best concepts we ever came up with. 
It gives people specific guidance for their business. Once you're there, almost universally, you take 40% out of, of profit for taxes. You leave 30% in for growth. And I can distribute 30% as a return on investment. Just, I don't need to leave everything in the business. I got enough cash to pay my taxes and I got enough cash to further capitalize it. And in most of our businesses that we teach to how to grow cash flow free, they don't even need to keep the 30% for capitalization. They, they can almost distribute 60% of their profit and then 40% goes out for taxes. Um, and I know and, I'm commingling terms, but, but to me is if I'm an entrepreneur and I am, that's the real scale, right? Yeah, let's, not, let's not delude ourselves into thinking I'm just going to grow and I can save out some costs later, uh, because it's a big fixed cost business and I got operating leverage, blah, blah, blah. Your scalability is based on your model. Yeah, it, it is. Is that model cookie cutter enough? If I think about fran restaurant franchises of the nineties, or I think about, uh, 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 here in San Luis, uh, an enter enterprise rent a car of you know the the early two thousands. It's like when you go from one location to three to five to mm -hmm. five hundred, it's because you've got a model that mm -hmm. that's cookie cutter. Yeah, but I, I've got a multi unit client that has opened twelve locations, and they're they're cash positive from day one. I mean, literally, the the location is profitable by the second month, and what, what they did was, was beautiful because they didn't try to own the real estate of every location that they set up. They just had somebody build a suit. They get a little minor, uh, capital loan to open the business that the business can easily pay back, but they're, they're cash flow positive on every new location that they open. Yeah. So they, they have infinite growth capacity. They just have to, they just have to find another market that they feel good about. Can they, can they get the, uh, the traffic you know, count, you know, for that location? And that's the smart way to, to do it. Yeah. Um, and you know, and, and a lot of people mix, what, what is the value proposition? Is it, is it in the real estate or is it in the operating model? The only companies that really struggle to grow cash positive is if you carry AR and inventory, I've got two working capital components that are generally very onerous and hard to finance completely. And it forces, I, I can't, those are the clients I have that struggle to get them off of the line of credit drug because they've got two hard numbers. And, and the idea is I'd be searching for an innovative way to, to get rid of one or the other or clients who have AR, but not inventory or, um, or, uh, inventory, but not AR. We can generally get them to a point of stabilization to where every unit of incremental growth is cash flow positive. Yeah. And so right. we call that, we call that, C, there's a, a formula in the 2.0 book called CPR, uh, cash, cash power ratio. And so you're looking at what we call a, 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 a term uh, we define called trade capital. So it's a modification of working capital that's actually more correct than working capital is. And you look at your trade capital ratio relative to your profit ratio, and you're trying to balance those two that as long as my, my profit is above my trade capital ratio, I'm cash flow positive for growth. I'm looking at the clock, Greg, I could, I could talk this for a very long time. Super, super interesting. Yeah. Very, very fresh, pragmatic approach to, to running and then growing small business. I, I'd love to have you back on the yeah, appreciate it. Time. in and of itself. I think we have a. Uh, have a whole bunch of topics we could go deep on. I'm going to include uh, links to uh, your books so people can purchase them online. I highly yeah. recommend. Uh, uh, I appreciate Greg, that. Anything you'd want to say in closing for, for people to understand? Nah, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I, I think just understand that, I mean, it's still the, the best, most valuable investment that you'll ever own is a privately owned business. It has the highest rate of return when run correctly of any investment you'll ever have. And so, in you know, so it, it don't, you know, don't be afraid of the challenges of the market because there's, there's plenty of poor performers that you can outperform, but you got to stick to the principles and, you know, yeah, you know, it, it, this is not an environment for the, you know, the, the, the stupid mindsets that we had in the dot com era and, 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 and some of the craziness that even in the last few years when the M and A activity just got out of hand 
and people were throwing money everywhere because yeah. all of those things kind of come back to the norm and, and the market settles back to, you know, physics and finance is based on physics. Uh, you know, if you don't make a profit, you eventually going to have a problem. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Greg, thanks so much for joining me. Today. Love yeah, appreciate it. Session. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it, Mike. And uh, to everybody else, thanks for joining today. If you got value today, uh, I, I invite you to like, comment, share with a friend, subscribe to the show, uh, whether it's on YouTube or whatever your podcast platform of choice is. Greg, thanks again for joining me. I can't wait to talk to you again in, uh, on some of these other topics. Yeah, good deal. Looking forward to it. And that does it for another episode of Mission to Grow. Until next time, everybody. Thanks. That's it for this episode of Mission to Grow. Thanks for joining us today. For show notes and more episodes, visit us at missiontogrow.com. If you found this content valuable, I invite you to share it with a friend and subscribe to the show. If you really want to help, I'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. To learn more about how Assure can help your business grow, visit assuresoftware.com. Until next time.